Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to Book Passage today and supporting your local independent bookstore. Uh, before we start, if you could just check that your cell phones are off. I know that Matt would appreciate that. You could check your cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Monica Golden, and I will be hosting this afternoon's event. I hope you've all had a chance to grab a glass of wine or water or the delicious cupcakes. Help yourself. Book Passage is thrilled to welcome Matt Coyle and his second book in the Rick Cahill crime series, Night Tremors. Nightmares of the man he killed two years ago still chase Rick through his sleep. When an old nemesis asks for his help to free a man from prison, Rick grabs with a chance to turn his life around. Matt's, Matt's first novel, Yesterday's Echo, won the Anthony for Best New Novel. Please give a warm welcome to Matt Coyle. Thank you. I'm going to talk until my voice goes. Um, it's great to be up here, uh, Book Passage. It's an incredible honor. It's a great, iconic bookstore. Um, it's always great to be in the Bay Area. It, it, uh, it means a lot to me. I've got family up here in the surra uh, surrounding environments, and um, my late mom grew up in Piedmont, and my agent lives very near here. <laughs> um, so we do, we do have a uh, few book people in the audience, um, but I'm going to tell a little story about the glory of being a mystery writer um, that some of the rest of you may not know about. Um, Joe knows all about it. So my first book came, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Let me get a little re retard. My first book came out um, two years ago, Yesterday's Echo. Um, it was coming out in May, I think, in um, Los, Angeles uh, Los Angeles Times Festival of Books um, has an event every April, I think it is. So it's a huge event. I think it's the first or second biggest um, book festival in the country. And it's at USC, it used to be at UCLA, which was nicer, but. Um, so I, I, I go every year, see that they have a huge uh, mystery area where the mystery um, tents are. And I always want to sign there, so I asked my uh, publishers, you know, do you mind if I get books early before the um, original pub date? They go, sure. So I thought, oh cool, now I'm, I'm an actual published author, and I'm going to do my first book signing. So, you know, I bought a special pen for signings and stuff. And, <laughs> I worked on my um, signature, which never got very good. But um, so I, I get up there. It's Saturday. I'm in the first group. You're sitting outside. It was a, it's always the hottest day in the spring, but it was a nice day. So I'm with um, I'm sitting outside with a um, self-published guy and another guy with a really small publisher. And it's a, you sit for an hour, and uh, people walk by. It's not like this. You're not really talking to people unless they stop and want to talk to you, or you wrangle them. Which you try not to do. So the, uh, we're like a half hour in, I got nothing so far. And I'm just, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm published. I want to sign some books. <laughs> so uh, self-published guy, three or four people bought his book. He's got like a little entourage, you know. And then uh, <laughs> the other guy selling two or three books. I got nothing. So it's about five minutes to go <clears throat> for my hour. <clears throat> and I haven't signed a book. I haven't sold a book. I haven't signed a book. So um, we're sitting right next to a sign that tells everybody's going to be there for the weekend. And this couple comes up and they go, oh, wow, T. Jefferson Parker's going to be here. And I said, yeah, I just saw him uh, down at uh, La Jolla at Warwick's the other night. He's great. I love his book. He's, you know, I buy all his books anyway. They go, really, La Jolla? We're from La Jolla. I'm like, what are you kidding? This is a, uh, that's yesterday's echo right there. That's actually a, a picture I took of, the, um, of, of uh, La Jolla Cove which is iconic, well-known um, to anybody in La Jolla. And I said, well, yeah, this is my book. It takes place in La Jolla. They go, oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, a lot, of it took, a lot of it is taken from a restaurant I used to work in called Chuck's Steakhouse. They go, you're kidding. They go, no. I said, hey, the guy that used to own that, Mark Richard, does a lot of carpentry for us at our house. I said, you're kidding. There's a character in there taken specifically from him. They go, no way. Yeah. Yeah, have a good day. <laughs> but later in the day, another tent results in this. But, um, so I, every writer I've ever known on tour that goes out on tour has got a book signing deal. So, um, so sort of back to the beginning, 
A couple months later, after uh, yesterday's app came out, I was at uh, a conference, my first, another first, first conference as a published author at um, California Crime Writers in Pasadena at the time. And uh, a guy, an author comes up to me and says, hey, I really like your book. I said, well, you know, it's another first, wow. A peer, now a peer, <laughs> said he liked the book. And uh, then he said, now you gotta do it again. Uh, that was kind of deflating because Anybody in the business knows that it takes at least about a year for a book to come out. So I really should have my other book done by now. And I wasn't. I had been working hard um, on the second book, but I wasn't making the progress I wanted to. And I thought, you know, it's supposed to get easier. This is, you know, don't you, Joe? Are you like me? You're slow. Good. <laughs> because the first book, it took me 11 years to get published from floppy disk to publication. <laughs> a lot of rejections, a lot of ignores. And I got a wonderful agent, got me a good deal. Um, so, but every time I get it back, or, or it wouldn't get, it would get rejected, I'd revise, I'd revise, I'd revise. And so, after 11 years, I poured a lot of me into it, and it's a series, so I poured a lot of this guy, Rick Cahill, um, into it. So, then I, then I sort of realized, well, yeah, I know why I'm having problems, because it's a series character. I write in first person, and I don't want to be doing. Um, um, murder she wrote, you know. I don't want to have him stumbling over bodies every year that make no sense. Like, he has to investigate because the police arrested his nephew or uh, his favorite clerk at Bonds or something. So I had to make it my, I had two rules for writing mysteries. Make it as realistic as possible and make it as interesting as possible. And so the realism thing, well, if he's a, if he's a, um, just a guy and people come to, or he, he bumps up against all these crimes, it doesn't make sense. We have a new fan. <laughs> right in front. <laughs> cool. Um, I see he doesn't have my book, but that's okay. Um, so, um, I had, there, had to be a re there had to be a reason for Rick Cahill um, to, do, to uh, investigate crimes. And he couldn't be a cop, he'd already been a cop, it hadn't gone well. In fact, he now lived by a code of, of from his late father um, that wouldn't go well uh, for a policeman because it's um, sometimes you have to do what's right even when the law says it's wrong. So that definitely doesn't work for police. So it made sense for him to become a private investigator. Um, he'd been a cop, although he'd been kicked off the force. Um, but he had a little bit of his background. So um, now he had a reason. He had paid to investigate. But for, for me, and I think for, for readers, it's, there still has to be some a reason for, well, there has to be some emotional attachment for the um, for Rick in the case to make it interesting. If he's just doing it for money, it's not it's not interesting to me. It's not interesting to the reader. It could start that way for money, and then something else happens. But so I had to find a case from the second book. As I said, like I said, I poured a lot out for Rick in the first book. Um, he went through a whirlwind, and it didn't end very well. So um, he's working, but. Ironically, at the beginning of the second book, he's doing really well financially. He's working for a very successful um, investigative firm in La Jolla. And he's making great money. In fact, he just bought a house. It's not La Jolla, but has a little sliver of view of the ocean. But he's not happy because he's working the adultery detail. And um, he's doing what he uh, calls bedroom clicks, where he's taking pictures of people doing what they shouldn't be doing with people they shouldn't be doing with. And after a while, that wears him down. And um, starts to erode it, erode his soul. But um, a guy comes in, a uh, former, um, uh, former adversary, actually, in the first book, named Timothy Buckley, comes with an opportunity to moonlight on a case to try to help free a guy, a kid in prison, not a kid. He was, in, he was 18 when he was arrested for murdering his parents and his sister. So that speaks to Rick because he'd been um, a suspect in his wife's murder. He'd been a suspect in the first... Um, in the first book, in a murder mystery as well. So when that um, opportunity comes, he takes it, he jumps at it, it's a moonlight. But um, it, it puts him in a bad situation with his, um, his boss because he worked at La Jolla PD, where which was the um, agency that arrested this kid. So it puts him uh, against his boss and his financial future. And it puts him against the La Jolla PD and his uh, former nemesis, or all-time nemesis, um, Tony Moretti, who's now chief of police. So then beyond that, he has to deal with a um, motorcycle gang who do all sorts of bad things as well as hired hits. So 
he doesn't know what all he gets, but he gets the information he needs, and he gets he has an out. He has an opportunity to you do what you need, and you can walk away from the case and feel good. So I'm just going to read a little bit um, of Rick at that situation and what he thinks. My voice is going. The name of the family, uh, the murdered family, were the Eddingtons. I'd come over to talk to Buckley about the case, not to walk away from it. But maybe this was the out I needed and would be smart to take. I could tell Bob I was off the case and keep my job. Then I thought of Jack and Rita Mae Eddington and their grandson. They'd seen, this, they'd seen the state of California's justice as blind and brunt, blunt and cruel, unwilling or unable to follow any path that didn't rest on the edge of Occam's razor. The simplest answer is usually correct. Randall had the most of the gain financially from the death of his parents, so he's the one who murdered them. As a kid worshiping my father before it all went wrong, I was convinced the police never made mistakes. Even after my dad was pushed off the force, I still believed in the police. I just stopped believing in my dad. Then after I became a cop in Santa Barbara, I saw that the police were human. We were human. We made mistakes, but we tried to get things right and correct them when they were wrong. Then my brothers in blue arrested me for murdering my wife, Hawkins Razor. Even after they released me, SBPD kept the spotlight on me and all the other leads grew stale. Colleen's murder was alive and free and still out there somewhere because the police made mistakes. I thought of why I became a PI, to help people the police had overlooked or didn't believe. Or those people who couldn't ask for the police's help because they'd done something wrong in the lost black and white eyes, but not the gray world where people lived. People who had no place else to go. I wanted to help those people because I'd been one of them. So, so, you have to read the book to find out if Rick goes back on the case. So, my favorite part is answering questions because I don't really like to talk to parents stuff. So, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Are you holding the, uh, will there be a book where you gain some further, somebody, somebody gives you a, uh, some idea of who might have killed your his wife. Yes. And so that what what are you working on that book now or is that always That's always out back there. Your, yeah. Because I don't really know that I don't really know who did it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand that. No. Yeah. yeah. No, but it is it's definitely something I have to address. I have to address Rick's father's situation, what happened to him on the police force, which actually may be book four, I'm writing book three right now, struggling. Um, but yeah, that definitely has to be addressed. I think it's unfair to the readers that they're going to stick around and they don't address it, but as soon as it comes through the ether, I'm going to get on that one. Hmm. Anybody else? Yes, sir. It's a purely selfish question just because I'm trying to do the same thing. When you, when you, you are doing the same thing. <laughs> when, you come up with, when you came up with the idea to go with the private investigator versus the murder she wrote, um, was the only decision, was that based on just because you wanted to avoid the Jessica Fletcher thing where she's always stumbling into that visor, or was there something else, a bigger picture that you could see for the series character, you know, a mystery in number two, a mystery in number three, a mystery in number four? So oh, I have it all laid out. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, I always knew I was going to write a PI, uh, a PI character, because that's what I read as a kid. I read Raymond Chandler, I read Ross McDonald. Um, so that's in my blood. Um, but I also knew that I had to have the story about how he became a PI. And, um, you know, it took many years for that book to get published. And at one point, I'd already started the second book thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll be lucky to be, I mean, uh, John Grisham, in that the second book is published after the first one does. Um, we'd all be, like to be lucky like John Grisham. Um, so I was, I was almost past the point where this whole backstory to his lead up as being a PI, I'd have to just, he just have to start as a PI. But um, luckily, um, Kimberly got me a deal. Um, but I always saw him as a PI, but as I write him, you know, it's first person, I'm a blank pager, it's what we, in San Diego, my writer's group, we always call it blank paging, other people call it seat of the pants. You know, you don't you don't really know what you're writing each day. I have an I, I have a beginning, I have an ending, and then I got to spend a year figuring out how to get there. Um, but as I do, I learn more about this character. Um, so the other stuff will fill in. Um, I'm always hope the woman who runs my writers group, 
tells me, you know, you have a really, your, your subconscious is a much better writer than you are, and I believe her. <laughs> so I just, I think about things a lot. I stare at the computer for a couple hours before I start writing, it seems like some days, thinking a lot. And then, then I let the subconscious fill in the blanks, hopefully. Anybody else? Come on, I bored everybody that much. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Why did you choose the murder mystery genre? You said it's in your blood. <laughs> Why didn't you that way? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, because I, it's in my blood and that I, it's something I read all my life. But I also think that, um, I think that, I, I hope that in my novels that the crime helps to unveil character for all involved, except for the dead person, of course. Um, for the murderer, even. For the victim's family and friends. You know, what happens when something, so this horrific happens in their lives, what does it do to them? And, and even um, for someone investigating the murder, if they have some emotional connection. So um, I think, it, you know, it's, it's the ultimate sin. So um, to me, it's the best way to unveil a character, and it's what I've read all my life. Yes? Um, how consciously do you make La Jolla and San Diego the, a character in your books, and how much do you adhere to, like, real geography? Um, I try to adhere to real geography as much as possible. Um, I was at a signing in, in Warwick's in La Jolla um, Thursday night, mm -hmm. and uh, a woman who's, who actually knows the uh, restaurant manager, owner rather, that I mentioned earlier, um, she's a huge fan. She goes to BoucherCon. She's not just a fan of me. I mean, she's just a huge mystery fan. A wonderful person. Goes all over the country to all these conferences. And she asks, she says, uh, why did you choose to use uh, some fictional things in La Jolla and San Diego? And I was thinking, I don't know. I didn't really think I did. And then she comes up to me. She comes up to me when I'm uh, signing books. And she said, I, uh, I used a, um, a house on Candlelight Drive. A friend of mine, one of my best friends, lived on that street as a kid. But I didn't want to use his address because, you know, something nefarious goes on at that house. So I made up, I made up an address. I drove up and down the, I drove up and down the street just weeks before I came up with the address. So I knew what the real address was, but I didn't want to have a real address. So she kind of looked at me and she said something like, there's no 5540 again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But so in, in another instance, I used a, um, I used a, a fict fictional um, name for a restaurant, thinking of a restaurant. It wasn't Muldoon's, which was Chuck's Steakhouse, but it was another restaurant where something uh, like some drug um, bust had gone down. I didn't want it was an existing restaurant. Hello, okay, here now it's going on business. I didn't want to have, you know, something that's real like that. But the rest I try to um, pretty much, I mean, I drive around town all the time um, trying to find new places. Even places I, I knew, you might find a different angle on. So I try to make the geography as real as possible. Yes, sir. So, um, I mean, I, you know, there's been a lot of sort of, I'll use the word mysterious murders that have gone on in San Diego over the years. So does that... Do you kind of research that and use that for inspiration and think about all the, the you know, just all the stuff that's been going on the last 50 years that we kind of we've read about the newspapers? And yeah. Um, fodder for... The, the set, this book actually is not from San Diego, but uh, Night Tremors. The idea came from, um, I watch a lot of true crime, um, like uh, 48 Hours and um, Dayline. And the story of this kid, um, not this kid, but it was the one it was taken from. Um, they probably did six or seven each. Each um, well, between the two of networks over five or seven years, maybe longer. They've probably done six or seven stories on this guy of uh, you know him you know, of just after his arrest and the horrible things, and then as they get more information, how it looks like he's um, innocent. And um, in the real life, the kid got out of prison. Um, but I do try to, I, I do try to, it helps, I do try to take stuff from that. I mean, I'm, you remember, the, you're from San Diego, you remember the, um, <laughs> the uh, who was it, um, the, the ex-wife who murdered, they made a TV movie out of it, who murdered her husband. And the, and the Broderick. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Her daughter used to be a hostess at the restaurant I managed, and this is before the murder. She would come in crazy. She would come in and, and make life horrible for her daughter. Like before, before everything went down. Um, I mean, she was a little, everybody knew it. Um, but I haven't, 
I have referenced some things, but not by name. But I haven't used specific, uh, I mean, they're always in the back, and I'm always researching for sure, but I haven't used a specific San Diego crime as of yet, I don't think. No. <laughs> I'm trying to take the one right now, but it's not. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I have something to say. You need to sit down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm his agent. I can say that. <laughs> so I can say this. But I've been listening to you talk, and you know, little that I know, I met Matt at a conference. I do conferences sometimes as an agent, and usually we don't see anything that's really very good. I'm sorry, it happens. And sometimes we're very surprised. But I met Matt. How many years ago? Three? It was, four? Uh, it was four years ago. It four was years ago. Okay. Love Coast Crime. No, California Crime. Little did I know, this book, Yesterday's Echo, was going to become the Anthony Award winning best first mystery novel. I had no idea. I mean, it's like I try and pluck things out of something <laughs> to try and find a voice that means something. I really had no idea. But I will tell you that the first sentence of this first book <laughs> is etched in my soul, and it got me. And it totally got me. I mean, I read it. Absolutely. You read the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read one sentence, okay? I'm going to read one sentence, and this sentence told me what a writer I had. Mm. It did. Okay. The first time I saw her, she made me remember, and she made me forget. It was like, he hooked me right there. It's like, what? What does that mean? I wanted to know everything about this person. So I'm telling you, as an agent, I'm so proud of Matt because he won the Anthony. I mean, even if he hadn't, I mean, I, I was hooked from that <laughs> sentence. And it's all about the words that make you feel something. So, kudos. <laughs> I can read the last sentence of a second. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if a, that is a good first sentence. It is a good sentence. I don't know if I'll ever come up with anything that good, honestly. Yes, you will. Um, but it, 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 it's, it did help me, it took me a long time to get to that sentence. I mean, I had written probably, uh, <laughs> I had written probably, you know, 40,000 words before I got to that sentence to revise at the beginning. Um, and when I did, when I did write that sentence, it did for me, it told me a lot about the character that I didn't know yet. And it made it more interesting to me. And um, that's when I felt like I had a book. That's when I felt like I had a character that I could write a series about. Probably four years into writing that book is when that happened. Anyway. Got me. <laughs> well, the whole first chapter, the whole first chapter was great. It was so it was so good that you, you when you're reading it you don't think it's delicious. you can with, you can hold that that level of momentum but you did all the way through. It was the second, the second chapter was good too. Well, I mean, the whole thing was like a roller coaster for me. But it was I just, appreciate it was just that. Brilliant. Another conference goer. <laughs> yes, ma'am. How did you name Rick? I mean, because we know, having read the books, that some of the names in the books come from people that you know and have encountered and things like that. But how did you pick? him that had you choose that name um well i wanted to as i said earlier i, I read all right remember Raymond channel i wrote seven novels but he wrote a lot of short stories too i read Raymond channel's kid or a teen but he's an inspiration to me so i wanted the, the initials to be rc for the protagonist mm. and i wanted it to be a hard c because it's more powerful than that i'm not a, i'm actually not a big fan of the name rick but it works for this character and i hope there's no ricks in here <laughs> um but I, it was a different name to begin with. He had a different last name. Um, and that sounded like, like a politician at the time. And, you know, God knows I didn't know it would take me another seven years to get published. But, um, so I changed it. And uh, I looked around. I, went, I, went, I wanted to be Irish, too. Surprisingly, I'm of Irish descent. Um, so I, I went in, you know, I went online and looked up uh, all these different names. And I found, uh, I like Cahill, Heartsea. Um, and then once I uh, chose it, I looked further and found out that it means, um, I wrote this down somewhere, it's um, something like um, warrior in battle or champion in battle or something, which Rick isn't, but he's very persistent. He's very, he's resilient in a very hard way, but 
Um, so it turned out it was kind of cool. And, and I found the, the coat of arms and stuff. When I, yeah. But that's a good question, thank you. I don't have to talk anymore, forget it. <laughs> All right, well thanks for everybody coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you.